So, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Ian Donnelly. I'm currently a senior at Northeastern University across the river in Boston. Uh, I major in history with minors in political science and law and public policy. Um, and my talk today, as we were told, is putting gerrymandering on the map. And it discusses some of the research that I've been doing over the past few months in developing what I've been calling the Redistricting Visualization Project. Um, which is a new, unique, one of kind way of viewing how and why congressional districts have changed over time. So I'm going to share that, and I'm going to share some of the things that I've learned doing this research with you. So first, what is gerrymandering? I'm sure that almost everyone in this room has heard about it. It's been in the news a lot recently. Um, but where does it come from? So the first gerrymander was actually from right here in Massachusetts um, in the 1810 round of redistricting. And the governor at the time was a man named Eldridge Gary. Um, and he had a hand in shaping a state senate district in Essex County, in the northeast portion of the state, um, that would favor his party, the Democratic Republicans, over the opposition Federalist Party. And contemporaries at the time were very unimpressed by this district. Um, they likened it, you can see it right here, they likened the shape to a salamander, and then they portmanded that with his name and came up with the term gerrymander. And it's since changed to gerrymander, but that's where the term comes from. And there's two important things I want you to take away from this story. One is that the first gerrymander, the original one, was drawn as an explicitly partisan exercise. It was drawn to favor one party over another party. And the second point is that they identified it as being wrong because of its irregular shape. Uh, around this time, most state senate districts were squares. They pretty much followed, uh, you know, they were square polygons. But this one curves around. And so they said, because of its shape, we can tell that it's a bad district. And those two ideas have become ingrained in how we think of gerrymandering today. That a gerrymandered district is one that is for partisan gain and irregularly drawn. So now I have a brief audience participation part. So there are two <laughs> maps on the screen. Um, you guys can see them. They are both real maps from Massachusetts history. One is gerrymandered and one isn't. And I want you guys to try to figure out which one you think is gerrymandered and which one isn't. So if you think the one on the left, this one is gerrymandered, raise your hand. And if you think the one on the right is gerrymandered, raise your hand. Yeah. Right? The one on the right is gerrymandered. You can tell, right? The, the shapes are all weird. It looks terrible. <laughs> um, but this is a little bit of a trick question, I'll admit. Um, the, I ask it to highlight a key point. Map one is from 1853, and it was drawn before any notion and any requirement of one person, one vote, uh, before any of the requirements of the Voting Rights Act, and it probably wouldn't hold up in a court of law today if it came before court for any of those challenges. Map two, on the other hand, is from 1993, and was involved in a uh, district court case of boundary districting, and they ruled that it is a completely constitutional uh, map. It follows, it adheres to one person, one vote. It follows the requirements laid out in the Voting Rights Act. But it looks funny. And that's the point that I want to illustrate, is that just because a state uh, congressional map has clean lines, just because its borders are, sh are, are straight and look good, does not mean that it's a fairly drawn map. And vice versa. Just because a map has irregularly shaped districts, does not mean that it's a unfair gerrymandered map. And we can unpack that a little bit more and get into the history of these shapes using um, the web app that I've been developing, the Redistricting Visualization Project, which I know is a clunky title. <laughs> um, the proportions on it get messed up a little bit here, but the, the basic way that it works is that you choose a state. Right now, I've been working on these four. Let's say you choose Massachusetts and a picture of the state comes up, and you can drag the cursor along and look at how the state's congressional districts have changed over time, and look at what common lines they follow, where the new boundaries originate, uh, where they shift. Um, up at the top, you can see the years that it's representing, and then down here, there's information about partisan control of the state legislature, uh, population of the state at the time, and then down here, there is brief little explainers about what went into the map that you're seeing right now. Was it a standard redistricting? Uh, every 10 years, the census uh, 
gets taken and then Congress reapportions the representatives and then the state redistricts itself, or was there more going into it? Was there a district court involvement? Um, did they redistrict the state within that 10 year frame? Uh, was there establishment of an independent commission? Something like that. And so I want to illustrate two, um, I want to I dive into this and illustrate two points that we can learn from the RBP. So um, let's jump up here and we can change the state that we're looking at to Arizona. Now Arizona is a really great state to understand the impact that the Supreme Court has had on the way that we redraw districts. So in 1964, the Supreme Court handed down a case called Westbury v. Sanders. And this was the case that said that congressional districts must be equal in population. Before that, there was no requirement, and pretty much no state adhered to that. After 1964, and between 1964 and 1972, the state of Arizona was sued three times in district court uh, and had to change its maps twice. Uh, and you can watch those changes happen as you move along in the scroller, and you can see the district get smaller and smaller. And this illustrates that prior to 1960, or in 1960, in the 1960s, getting uh, districts to be equal in population in and of itself was such an uphill battle. Uh, the state of Arizona had to be sued three times, and none of those cases had any allegations of partisan advantage or being drawn for partisan gain, even though there was an aspect of partisanship by the unequal populations but they were only alleging population variance. That in and of itself was the thing that they were trying to get on top of. And every single state that I've looked at, the, the four that you saw, have cases that are filed in the wake of this decision. And that's true across the country. And it also speaks more to, you can look at the, the districts before 1960, and they, for the most part, are neat lines. They look the way we want districts to look, but they are not fair districts by any stretch of the imagination today. Now the second case that I want to highlight is also from Arizona. So I pull up this map and you can look at it, and it looks weird, right? It doesn't really look the way that we want a district to look. There's this weird carved out notch that we don't like. And viewed in isolation, this map would tell a story that says that you know this map has clearly been gerrymandered for whatever reason. You know the politicians probably drew this, but this map was drawn by the Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission, a uh, nonpartisan body. And jumping back in time a little bit, we can see the previous map also has this car map. It also has this notch, and this map was drawn by the federal district court in Arizona, and it was drawn to break a deadlock between. Uh, the two chambers of the Arizona legislature that couldn't decide on a new redistricting map. And the reason that this area is carved out is because the map that the district court used was based on a plan called the Indian Compromise Plan. It was submitted by one of the Native American tribes in Arizona. And this area that's carved out is the Hopi Native American Reservation. And the area surrounding it is the Navajo Native American Reservation. And it's drawn this way because although these are both Native American tribes with interests within that general umbrella, these two tribes historically have not really gone along with each other. And so when the uh, district court drew this, cape, drew this map um, in 1992 in light of a amendment to the Voting Rights Act passed in the 80s, it put an emphasis on treat minority groups uh, ethnic groups, language minorities, racial minorities, as separate groups that deserve their own representation beyond general umbrella terms. And that's part of why it was carried over as well into the 2003 to 2013 um, set of districts. And that illustrates also that gerrymandering isn't, just because a map looks weird, just because a map is gerrymandered, because this map is gerrymandered by definition, but it's not necessarily a bad gerrymander. You might disagree about whether or not they should do this, but it's not drawn for partisan gain. It's not drawn to give an advantage to one party over another. And so jumping back to my presentation, if it'll stay up, um, there's three main points that I want to leave you guys with that I've learned from my research. First, 
is the, and, and things that the RVP can bring to the table and how it can enhance the discussion surrounding gerrymandering and redistricting that we're having right now in this country. First is that it allows us to understand the broader unique stories that every state has with redistricting. For the most part, the uh, typical narrative of redistricting is that the census happens every decade, they send the changing populations among the states to Congress. Congress reapportions the number of representatives, sends that information to the states, and the states redraw their districts based on the new reapportionment. And it happens every 10 years. But beyond that, almost every state has some deeper story to tell. Maybe they redistrict within that 10 year span for some reason. Maybe there's a lawsuit that involves redistricting. Uh, maybe it goes all the way to the Supreme Court. Maybe there's an establishment of an independent a political body to do redistricting. And those stories are integral for us to understand the redistricting process in this country and through history. Second is that the RVP provides a visual history for us. Uh, graphs and data charts are important for understanding redistricting and gerrymandering, but they don't tell the whole story. At some point, a map of districts are maps. Those are visual tools that we should listen to. And the RVP provides an opportunity to get that in context visual history in a way that nothing else does right now. And third, we can use all of that together, all of that history, that visual history, that in-depth research history, to create better targeted policy solutions. Because there are bad gerrymanders out there, and we should absolutely challenge them. But if we focus our efforts on challenging just irregularly shaped districts, then we will still have gerrymandered districts. They will just be pleasing to the eye. And we need to dig further into what those districts that we don't like represent more than what is just on the surface. And the RVP can help us do that. And with the last however amount of time that I have, um, I have a few thank yous and sources. Um, particularly um, Professor Jeff Lewis, um, who's uh, out at UCLA. He's the one who made all of the maps that I'm using for the RVP. Um, and Professor Ken Martis uh, started all of this in the 1980s when he published a wonderful atlas on uh, congressional districts going back through American history. So I have to thank them immensely. Um, and uh, hopefully my plan is that I can have a functional, uh, visually appealing, um, live version of the RVP up online by the end of, or by May um, for people to explore and play with on their own and do more work with this as a starting point. So thank you so much.